Hey, welcome today to Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Kevin Clarkson. I've been sharing recently a series on the mysteries of the New Testament. And the concept is everybody loves a mystery. You know, we're always fascinated by the opportunity to watch dramas and mysteries and kind of find a whodunit. I think it's always intrigued us when we find a case compelling as that. Well, it may interest us to remind ourselves that in the New Testament, the word mystery appears several times. And Jesus made a statement as he began his ministry of giving parables. He spoke in dark sayings and utterings not heard since the foundation of the world, to quote an old psalm. But the Bible says that Jesus uh, was asked by his disciples after giving the first parable, the parable of the soils, uh, why do you speak to the people in parables like this? Here's how he answered Matthew 13. He said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not given. And we've already had a study on that saying and that expression and why he said that. Just to remind ourselves that part of what God is doing is uh, restricting the severity of his judgment. For those who will not receive the light and will not receive the truth, God actually withholds it from them, lest they be accountable for more and so incur a stricter wrath. That's actually a kind of a backside of his mercy, if you will. Uh, But the Lord says, in the way that I reveal truth in the parables, in the one hand, the truth is revealed, but to the others, it is concealed. And it all depends upon the state of your heart. That's the real subject of the parable of the soil. Same seed dropped in the ground, four different kinds of soil. It's the receptivity to the word of God that makes all the difference. And let's be those people who have a good and noble heart, as Luke 8 calls it, who are open to the word of God, who have a repentant brokenness about us where God can quickly speak to us. Well, Jesus went on to tell parables in Matthew 13, and he issued in this idea of the mysteries of the kingdom. And so as we come into the New Testament, what we've done is selected nine or ten of the more intriguing ones. Now, being a guy that loves mystery stories and uh, and just the fun of solving criminal cases, I've given these some kind of fun names just to help us explore it. We, We talked about the case of the blind guide. And that, of course, is Romans 11, where it says blindness in part has happened to Israel until the times of the Gentiles' fullness. And so we understand that the nation Israel, it is a mystery that they are blinded. They rejected their Messiah, but the Lord did not reject them. And this is where replacement theology and a whole different approach to eschatology and prophecy goes off the rails by failing to understand the mystery of the blind guide. God is not through with Israel. God is not through with the Jew. And he is going to reclaim them and redeem them in that last and final generation. And we see a summation of that well said throughout many Old Testament scriptures and explicitly stated in the book of Revelation. So let's realize the case of the blind guy. Then we saw that the idea, the mystery that I called vanished without a trace. When Paul spoke to the Corinthian church and said, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And the idea here was that uh, that final generation will not actually enter into the sleep of death, but they will be metamorphs and transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. And so they too will join those who have died in Christ in a total, literal, physical resurrection. And it's called a mystery. And then we looked last uh, time at the mystery of the church, and I called it really the case of the unwitting accomplice. And we're all aware of those instances where somebody is maybe by a con man sort of lined in or are brought in off the street and they're totally unaware. They're just being used uh, in a case as a decoy to maybe draw attention away from the real uh, crime as it's taking place. And then the real criminals flee and the decoys kind of left there holding the bag. What happened? Well, the church has been something of an unwitting accomplice. As Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, it was a great mystery not known, but now... The Gentiles are fellow heirs of Israel in the church. And so we are winning now. Now the mystery is revealed and we do get it. But, you know, we sort of didn't plan from the ages to be saved. We didn't have the kind of call on us as nations and individuals as the nation Israel did. But God found a way to fold us into his plan. And with great joy, we've joined it. Now, today we want to talk about the mystery of what I call the bedazzled bride. And I want to invite our attention to Ephesians chapter 5. 
in the middle of a passage on the Christian life, on walking in the fullness of the Spirit. Paul gives instructions to marriage, and he talks about how that home, that relationship of husband and wife, is to reflect a mutual love and a devotion and sacrifice and laying their lives down for each other, uh, both in sacrifice and in submission. And then he says uh, some interesting things beginning in verse 29. No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Of course, in that verse 31, Paul is reaching all the way back to Genesis, to that first wedding in Eden, where God the Father presents Eve to Adam, and this statement is made about a man leaving father and mother, cleaving to his wife. But then Paul adds this in verse 32 of Ephesians 5. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So this idea of a mystery, that the church would be a bride, Again, we have to realize with all of these mysteries that you and I who live on this side of Pentecost and Calvary, we've heard these things all of our lives. We've been steeped in them now for 20 centuries. It doesn't seem like any kind of shocking new revelation to us. But this was absolutely breathtaking when it was spoken. Uh, It was something that was not known in previous ages, but was revealed in the days of the apostles. Because in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, Israel was called Uh, the wife of Jehovah. And uh, the Lord had not truly forsaken her, but she had certainly been unfaithful to him repeatedly and so had been, in in a sense, set aside for a while. But now the bride, the church, which will end up including the redeemed in Israel, is known as the bride of Christ. What we want to do as we look at this today is try to pull together just a few strands. And I thought it would be great and instructive if we'd go back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis and look at some of the early weddings there indeed we want to have an opportunity to consider three weddings out of Genesis and see what they tell us about the church and her groom Christ so if I may go with you to Genesis chapter 2 we'll look at that first wedding when there were wedding bells in Eden and the Bible says in the, uh, Genesis chapter 2 uh, verse 21 the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And at this point we believe it's the Lord Jehovah who spoke. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. The reason we believe the Lord pronounced those words, number one, he was officiating the wedding, but also Adam would not have had a father or mother, and he had never seen a marriage. He wouldn't know what a husband and wife were. And so it's of the Lord to give this pronouncement that he might give the human race the direction But embedded in this first wedding is a bit of a picture for us of the mystery of Christ and the church. And I would say that the great key here is that we, the church, have been created and forged from Jesus' wounded side. I want you to think about that for a moment. Adam was alone, verse 18. It says that uh, the Lord said, it's not good that the man be alone. I'll make a help meet for him. And so even though the Lord had made a perfect creation, he, he sensed that, that man, of course, that he has always planned, would, would have a mate, a companion. And so the Lord brought the need before Adam's eyes by bringing the animal kingdom in the next few verses. He, he parades the animals, and, and Adam is given the assignment to name the animals. And I think he notices that all of them are in pairs. There's a male and a female, but it said there was not found a companion for him. And it's at that point that God put a deep sleep on him and supplied his need. Now, Adam had a need before he realized it. Let me get uh, just a little spiritual nugget for us here today. A lot of times, you know, we have a crisis when we discover a need in our life. Something happens, we realize we're short on cash, or there's been an emergency, or there's been something we didn't foresee, couldn't have been ready for, and it precipitates a, a real need and crisis in our thinking. 
But see, the Lord wasn't caught off guard. God never says, oops. He knew what was coming, and he already has an answer before we've even discovered the need. That's really clear here in this Genesis passage. God already had the answer, Eve, in his heart and mind before he brought her forth to Adam. He knew what he was going to do. And just as when uh, Jesus turned to his disciple and and said, how are we going to feed this multitude when they stood before the 5,000 men on the hillside, John 6 says that Jesus, he himself, knew what he would do. Many times the Lord is just allowing us to be tested to test our faith because he's already got the answer. And let me give a quick word of encouragement since we're talking about marriage today. Maybe you're in a marriage that you think could be better. Maybe you're in a marriage that you've come to regret. Maybe you're in a great marriage, but whatever the case, there's always a new chapter and a new challenge and a new need. Can I tell you that God already has an answer before you've discovered the need? God's already solved your problem before you even realized it. I like to think often when I encounter these kind of situations, the Lord solved our greatest problem 2,000 years before we of this generation were born. For you see, our greatest problem was sin and our debt to God, and we were condemned to hell. And God had already taken care of that, actually from the foundation of the world. And so he's already met the need. What we need to do is couple up with God, get close to him, and discover how he wants to bring his need and his answer to us in a way that brings him honor and glory and stretches our faith. Well, the case for the church here is that this, God put a sleep on Adam and from his side extracted the rib and from it shaped or fashioned the woman then brought her to the man. In the very same way, the church, the bride of Christ, will be brought to him. She was taken and cut from his wounded side on Calvary. Jesus entered the sleep of death and was laid in the tomb and then raised in the awareness of resurrection. But there the wounds had been made. And from the wounded side of our Savior, the church came forth, formed and forged by the hand of God. What a beautiful picture. And I think what it speaks of us is that there is a romance, if you will. There is a love that is the touchstone of this relationship. And let's remember that as a church, we're not about just being some kind of ecclesiastical organization. God help us if that's all we are. We're not just some social institution trying to meet needs in the world. That's good, but it's not far enough. Our primary thing is to be a companion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church is headed for a destiny of glory as the bride of Christ. And realize that it was all birthed from his wounded side. Have you come to the wounded side of Jesus? Have you come to Calvary and cast yourself on him for mercy and forgiveness? Because that's where it all began. Now there's a second wedding that takes place in Genesis that I want to have us look at. And it's in Genesis chapter 24, verses 57 to 58. And we'll see here the wedding of, um, of Isaac and Rebekah. And as we turn, and I'm just... Uh, momentarily looking for the passage here it is the scripture tells us that abraham sent his servant who is unnamed we believe he was eleazar the chief uh, of abram's household chief steward but he's unnamed in this passage he's just the helper and he is sent by abram to go fetch a bride for isaac and he's told to go to a far country to the people of origin uh, from where abram had come And this is a picture of the Holy Spirit, if you will. The Holy Spirit goes forth into this world to fetch a bride for the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now that Christ has ascended to glory, the Holy Spirit is involved in calling out and calling forth the bride through these ages. And let's not forget the spiritual agency that has to happen. We can preach the gospel. We can have a Bible study. We can do a broadcast. We can do any number of things. But it's the work of the Holy Spirit of God, that unseen, unnamed helper who is working ahead of God and going before us to bring forth the bride. And uh, as we read in Genesis 24, I wanted to draw your attention to verses 57 and 58. It's a lengthy chapter and you can read it all and there are many truths to be mined, but we don't have time for them now. Verse 57 though says that the consent of the young woman was asked by her family. Uh, The servant said, we're ready to take her to marry Isaac. Uh, Her father and mother said, we're willing to let her go. But they said in verse 57, we will call the damsel and, and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebecca. 
and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. I'm amazed she had never seen him, so she was doing an arranged marriage. And of course, that's more common in other cultures than we're used to in ours. But the amazing thing is she just went by faith. You know, there's a verse in 1 Peter chapter 1 that says that we love Jesus whom we've never seen. Not having seen you love. And it says we await for our salvation. We too have never seen the beloved face of our bridegroom. But we by faith are waiting for that day that he comes to take us. And right now until that time we have answered the call of the helper. Of the unnamed servant of God the Holy Spirit. Who has come to fetch a bride. And he is making that appeal to us. And even as Rebecca gave her answer and said yes. And then she forsook her world she forsook her plans she forsook her family to come into isaac's we are called to do the very same thing when we're called to follow christ out of this world the lord asks us to separate from this world system from its lies from its philosophies from its pleasures from its passions from its ambitions we're called to be pilgrims and sojourners strangers in this land this is not our home so we better not put roots down and indeed our our citizenship is in heaven and we're waiting for our heavenly bridegroom to come and call us and so the call here is that we would leave this earth in the sense of in our heart affection and be married unto another even jesus christ you've got to determine right now if you're going to follow Christ, that that's what you'll do. It actually, in Romans chapter 7 and other New Testament places, describes and compares Christianity to a marriage. And you really are, in a sense, receiving Christ as your bridegroom in a spiritual way. You're signing away the rights to your future. You're giving away the rights to your plans. You're taking Him and His direction, agreeing to... Follow his lead the rest of your life and let him care for you and provide for you. You're taking his name. And even as in a literal ceremony, a bride might receive a ring, we receive a symbol of baptism that we are going to be his follower. And it's a beautiful thing. Now, let me say there's a third wedding in this book of Genesis that I want us to look at. And uh, we might be familiar with Adam and Eve. I expect everybody is. And we might be very comfortable discussing Isaac and Rebecca. But I wonder how many of you, don't grab a Bible or look on your Google, uh, how many of you know the name of the bride of Joseph? You see, Isaac uh, himself is going to have a son named Israel, and Israel will have 12 sons. And one of uh, Israel's 12 sons is named Joseph. And the story of Joseph is a beautiful story. It's a story of a son who is betrayed by his brothers, sold for pieces of silver, um, thought dead but seems to suddenly reappear alive again then he's put down into a deep dark dungeon after his betrayal and suddenly raised and elevated to the vice presidency of all the land in a day there are a lot of parallels there to our lord jesus christ i mean he was betrayed and and rejected by his own brothers the house of israel 30 pieces of silver judas sold him he was uh, turned over and and his blood was shed and is, uh, would, would be uh, thought gone forever and dead, and yet he rose three days later. But during that time, he also uh, descended into hell for us. He, he spoiled principalities and powers and made an open display of them, triumphing over them by the victory of the cross. And then he rose alive forevermore, and now he's exalted at the right hand of God and has been given a name above every name. Now, when Joseph is exalted, and not until he is exalted, That's when his bride is going to be presented to him. So I would direct you to Genesis chapter 41. And let's just take a moment and read uh, just a few verses out of this beautiful chapter. As Joseph, under the hand of God, gives um, Pharaoh the interpretation of his dream about the famine. And then he brings forward these words uh, about a plan to help them get through the crisis. Set aside for the seven years of plenty, for the seven years of famine. And so when he's all done giving the plan and the administration, he says, put someone over this and do it. And Pharaoh looks around on his advisors and he says, well, who's more wise than this young man? It's obvious the spirit of God is on him. And so they trusted the task to Joseph. And then they thought, well, if we're going to make him one of our, um, you know, main administrators in the land, 
we need to provide a bride for him. So we come to Genesis 41, verse 44. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh was basically giving Joseph authority over every detail of Egyptian life. And in verse 45, Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnapadaena and gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. The rest of the chapter describes uh, how he gathered the grain during the years of plenty and put it into storage for the years of poverty that would be coming. And then I wanted to read to you, if I might, down in verse 57. It says that verse 54, seven years of dearth began to come according as Joseph had said and the land began to be famished. Verse 57, and all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all lands. You know, there's a real picture here, I think, of the church. Paul said, speaking of Christ in the church, a man and his wife, he said, I speak a great mystery. The church is much like Joseph's bride in this case. We don't really see her actively by his side, but I'm sure she's there in a very supportive role, and she joins him in his work. And that work is to provide food and bread for a famished world. What is the church about right now? We're taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. We're feeding the pasture, the flock of God. We're providing the bread of God's word to a famished world. And that's the call that's upon us in this age. We are to be uh, the Asenath unto Joseph. We are to be the bride who on this age and on this stage is helping deliver uh, the food to the famished. We're to bring the word of God. And that's our calling. Listen, if you belong to a church and it is not actively teaching and preaching and feeding the true word of God, it's not being what a church is supposed to be. Jesus said to Peter, he said, do you love me? Three times. And Peter said, yes. And every time Jesus said, well, feed my lambs. It matters to the heart of God that his sheep be cared for and that the world receive the bread of life, the word of salvation. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So that's part of our destiny now. And it's very exciting to contemplate that. As you think about these three brides, Eve, Rebecca, Asenath, Every one of them stood with great pleasure and great pride by the side of their husband, standing with him in unity to fulfill his job, standing with him in support to help it be better. And that's what we do. The Lord doesn't need our assistance or our help, but he graciously invites us to join him in his great enterprise of bringing salvation to this earth. He has paid the price on the, ca- on the cross, and it's up to us to go and share the word. Now, there is one other picture of this mystery that we must look at because it is so thrilling to us. And uh, so I want to invite you quickly to John chapter 14. Many of you will be familiar already with where we're headed, but there may be those that are newer to these areas of Bible study and the teaching and truth of Scripture. Jesus in John 14 is gathering his disciples in the upper room, and he will be going shortly to the cross. He will be leaving them. He's giving them instructions. And to prepare them, he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He'll be a helper to you. He will be there to be your assistant, your strengthener, your enabler, your empower. He will help you recall my words. He will give you courage in the hour that you stand to testify for me. He will give you assurance of the things that I've told you. And so as he prepares us, he gives a great promise to us. John 14, verse 1. And we usually hear this read at funerals without a slightest idea of all that it is about. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Well, Jesus is giving something that 
we've heard so many times at funeral services probably we, we understand the idea about mansions in his house and him coming to get us but we don't understand the way his Jewish audience heard this because it was the custom for this to be a bride who was sought after by her groom. You see, in the Jewish wedding understanding, the groom would ask the bride for her hand in marriage. The arrangements would be made. But the actual coming to fetch her and bring her home to the place he prepared was an unannounced hour. Her job was to be watching and ready. She didn't know if it would be day or night or middle of the night. She simply had to be ready and waiting for his coming. And as so often the case was to make it fun and festive, the bridegroom would come at midnight. There would be a, a cry, Behold, the bridegroom comes, and the party would, would dance out into the night and fetch the bride. And with great joy and singing, they would take her from where she was, seize her, snatch her, and bring her to the prepared home of the groom where she would spend their married life together. This is nothing other than a picture of the rapture of the church when Christ will come for his own. At an hour unannounced, he says to be watching, to be waiting, to be ready. He will arrive and he will come and take us to himself that where he is, there we may be also. What an exciting anticipation. And this is part of that New Testament mystery of the bedazzled bride you know it's usually the bride who bedazzles she is the one who is center stage but in our case the bride herself is left dazzled because the bridegroom outshines us all that's the glorious lord jesus I want to let you know about a book offer that uh, our good friend doc marquis has done it's just come available the printing has just happened it's called the final rapture and uh, this is uh, just a fresh look at what i've just described the rapture of the church and it makes the solid case that the church is going to be delivered out before the troubles and tribulation and judgment begin. We believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. This makes an outstanding case. And then it relates it to current things going on in our world right now. I had the privilege of writing the foreword and previewing this book for uh, Doc Marquis. We're offering this right now through our bookstore. And you can call the 800 number on your screen. Or go to our bookstore, prophecyinthenews.com. And it's available for $15.95 and shipping and handling. Hope you'll secure a copy. It'll bless you and you'll enjoy it. But more important than getting a book, listen, is getting your name in the book of life. If you don't know the Savior today, if God has spoken to your heart, I want to urge you to call on his name and to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, to forgive your sin, and to change you from the inside out. You too can surrender to our beautiful, wonderful groom and be part of his glorious bride and share a breathtaking destiny with those of us who are called to be his people. Till then, let's keep looking up.